just maybe to get started while Chris sets this up, um, where Talia left us is a good sort of way for me to sort of segue into what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, which is the nexus between identity, communication, and politics. Um, I took more of a conceptual approach uh, as well, in part spurred on by um, an email exchange I had with Chris where he sort of said, well, how do we study this stuff um, when it comes to, to um, populism and, and identity? And this sort of draws on various strains of work that I've been doing um, and, and, and sort of also thinking about going forward. So I want to do two primary things today. Um, the first is to talk about various conceptual perspectives on identity um, and how that intersects with, with politics. Um, and then I'm going to talk about just two sites of identity work. Um, so what elites do in the course of campaigns um, and how partisan media works in the context of identity. And what's important here, and I think to break with, with my fellow panelists, is that I want to focus more on identity than epistemology, which is to say I'm less interested here in the cognitive bases of democracy and truth and more interested in the various stories people tell um, about who they are and about what groups they belong to and who should be in office on that basis, who legitimately can represent them. I think it's a topic that has received less attention in the political communication literature. Let me just start um, with some perspectives on identity. I will say um, I included a lot of text on these slides just because they're quotes coming from theorists that I've been thinking a lot around. I'll walk you through what I think are the most important parts. The reason why is I just want to nod in their direction here um, and sort of give credit where it's due. But also they're signposts, and these are works that I view as conceptual signposts um, that should shape our thinking about this. Um, to start, Craig Calhoun sort of had a famous statement in 94 on a really wonderful volume called Social Theory and the Politics of Identity. Um, broadly, what he's, what he's arguing here is that social identity is premised on social difference. Um, and it's that difference between self and society, individuals and groups, in groups and out groups, right? Um, and publics, public ways of being known by others. And two important points that Calhoun makes is that, um, first of all, we all have multiple identities. We have identities in our communities where we grew up and where we live. We have religious identities. We have racial and ethnic identities. Uh, we have political identities, etc. And politics maps onto how those things fit within parties. I'll talk about that in a minute. And second, and this is key, identities are not something that you're just simply born into and, and given and static, but they're actively constructed. And part of politics is to construct identities upon which ultimately to win and hold legitimate office. Two dominant sort of uh, approaches to identity, I would say, um, at least in the communication literature and some veins of sociology. Um, on the top is sort of, this comes from Zizi Papacrisi, um, who's amazing, and she wrote this great book called A Network Self. Um, but it fits with that story of broad social disembedding. And this stems from Anthony Giddens' work uh, in the early 1990s broadly. But the argument is that in the modern era, in contemporary life, we've seen the disabetting of people from traditions, from institutions, from places, from locales. Um, and into this context, right, steps what ZZ sort of talks about as the reflexive play of identity. The idea that in contemporary life, people are more free to craft their own identities uh, on what basis they feel like sort of most represented by. They sort of pick and choose among a vast media landscape to craft that self. Um, and it's a reflexive play. Manuel Castells, ironically enough, in an argument I don't think has gotten enough attention compared to his other work. It's, it's the second volume of his great trilogy called The Power of Identity. This was published in 98. Actually makes the very strong argument that says only elites get to play with reflexive identities. Only elites get to be the ones who get unmoored from class positions and class identities and geographic identities and religious identities. And in contrast, what you see, Castells argues, um, is what he calls cultural communes. These cultural communes that get crafted on the basis of things like nationalism, religiosity, um, uh, race and ethnicity, and these communes often offer sort of defensive, solidaristic uh, forms of identity that provide mooring in a world of global networks and global power, right? So it's ways for people who are comparatively 
disenfranchised. Um, it fits with the economic story we told earlier, right? The story of status. It's a way for people to craft an identity that's not like this cosmopolitan global elite identity. And that becomes a way that they can sort of graft onto power, right? Clinging to God, nation, and family, uh, for instance. I think this is a super perceptive argument uh, for the late 90s. Um, one of the key things, I think, are the ways in which people's identities map onto partisanship. We've sort of seen various stories being told here. I like this argument from uh, Alan Abramowitz and Stephen Webster. Um, that one of the things that we see in US politics, at least, is that partisan identities have become increasingly aligned with other social and religious and economic cleavages, right? Um, and race and religion are the two big ones. The Republican Party is predominantly a white party. To be a Republican means to be white and to have white people's interests at heart. Uh, Democrats are seen and perceived to be the party of people of color. This is a long historical story of, of the uh, racial alignment of the two parties, beginning in the post-civil rights era um, movement, Nixon's Southern strategy, et cetera. But broadly, that big cleavage between whites and people of color on, uh, on the one side, mapping onto Democratic and Republican. And that's one reason, uh, Abramowitz and Webster argue, that we see growing suspicion and hostility um, uh, we see negative partisanship, we see uh, increasing sort of negative evaluations of people um, who are in the out party, right? So partisanship and polarization have to be put in this broader context of social identities and social cleavages. One of the arguments I made, and, and this is um, something where I tried to synthesize various recent work, is to sort of say that if we take partisanship, and again, partisanship as a meta overarching identity that includes lots of social identities underneath, like race and religion, um, that if we think about the role of partisanship, we have to think about it on two terms. One is the ways in which partisan shapes moral evaluation. Here I was playing with uh, Jeff Alexander's work on the civil sphere, um, which talks about the cultural basis of democracy. The idea that there are civil um, cultural structures and a civic morality around things like liberty and equality and justice, and the ways in which partisanship starts to work to change how people actually morally evaluate candidates. Um, a great example of this is to just look across the board at Democrat and Republican responses to uh, Donald Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton during the election. Um, ways in which partisanship became the basis for moral evaluation. Um, 90 percent of um, uh, Republicans voted for Donald Trump, 89 percent of Democrats voted for Hillary Clinton, um, but a way to get a sense is 82 percent of Clinton voters said that Hillary Clinton had the temperament to serve as president, 89 percent of Trump voters said she did not, 72 percent of Clinton voters said Trump did not have the president and vice versa. 94% of Clinton voters said that she was honest and trustworthy, and an identical number of Trump voters said the same about their candidate. Those are civil evaluations, right? Ways that we expect democratic leaders. The point is that partisanship shapes how people understand and read uh, uh, their political candidates and their political representatives. Uh, and then secondly, sort of following from that, the argument that I try to make in this paper, and Talia started us down this road as well, is that through things like motivated reasoning, cultural cognition, et cetera, um, the ways in which identity shapes epistemology is something that's increasingly sort of apparent. So the facts that you see as being true and who's speaking comes from who you are as a person who's making those claims and how you understand those claims positioned against people in your social groups and what they're supposed to believe, right? Could be, right, Republicans expect the Keystone Pipeline to be good for economics, then they're going to privilege that argument and increasingly sort of downplay things that they're not supposed to see or believe in. And I think one of the key challenges of our era is that journalism has largely stayed the same as the world has gone increasingly more polarized sort of around it. All right, let me just talk about identity work and sort of show the ways in which these uh, forms of identity get performed. Um, a book that's been really, I think, influential for me is Roger Smith's uh, a great piece on political peoplehood. It puts identity at the center of understanding contemporary politics. Um, 
and basically argues that what politics is, is it's contestation. But it's not about who gets what, when, and how, but basically about who governs, which human beings, which social group have legitimate authority um, uh, to order the activities of at least some group or some groups of, of human beings. All right? That, in, in Rogers' sort of argument, is what, is what uh, politics is about. And what's important is that we can only understand this by sort of understanding the stories of peoplehood that political elites and political leaders tell in the context of an election, right? Political advocates say, here you are and here's you can be. They outline your past and your present. They say what the results will be if you do or do not accept this form of political membership. And here are the broad sort of the grand story of, of political and, and political life. And for Rogers, methodologically, what we have to do is take at least an interpretive approach, whether we're going to study something quantitatively or qualitatively, to understanding the broad stories of peoplehood that elected leaders um, or people vying for civil power have to outline and, and have to achieve. Um, and those stories, and, and that will help us understand why persons come to think they have the interest values affirmative actions, uh, uh, affirmations and obligations they seek to fulfill in the context um, of an election. Okay, so let me just walk you through a little bit on campaigns and sort of just some examples of sort of how this works, drawn from some of my empirical work. Um, just to start, this great book that a number of people have mentioned, the, the Aiken and Bartel's book, Democracy for Realists, what are campaigns about? They're reminding voters of their partisan identities, right? Who cares about issues and what they uh, uh, and what people think about public policies? What's more important is to say, you're a Republican, you should be voting with Donald Trump, right? You're a Democrat, you should be voting with Hillary Clinton. And what's important is that most Republicans aren't populist, right? But when they see a choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and they know who their in-group is with, and they know who they identify with, and they kind of know, like broadly, that Republicans represent people like them, that's where they pull the lever, right? Um, that's how you end up in that direction. But even more importantly, I think in our contemporary era, we've talked a lot about sort of the fragmenting of the media system. This is where you also see groups and informal communications networks around group um, uh, members start to also play a role in connecting particularistic identity to political party affiliation and making those connections. One great example, I won't play the video, um, but, but this is the, um, the Donald Trump rally in Asheville uh, on September 12th, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where he took up Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment um, three days before, and he brought um, a bunch of deplorables actually on stage um, to, to basically sort of make this appeal. These are the people who Hillary Clinton is saying is deplorable. And look at us. This is us, and this is her looking down on people like us. Um, and it was a super powerful moment. I'm going to run out of time, so I won't play it. But you can also see, and, and if you play the video through, all these cell phones just shot up. Like people were filming these, these just these ordinary people who were attending this rally, who were chosen to be on stage and sending that out in their own social networks. Right? This is a story of us versus them. Um, and not. <laughs> I love this shot. Um, not too much uh, longer later, this is three days later, he um, uh, goes to a rally uh, in Florida and against a Photoshop backdrop of a promotional poster for Les Miserables um, to fit, you see the soaring eagle, the Trump signs, and there's a lot to unpack in there, um, right, sort of talks about this idea that we are the deplorables, right? It becomes the in marker of identity. It's everything else that Washington elites and Hillary Clinton in particular and Democrats look down on, right? Um, we're average everyday folk. These are the people that they look down on us for being parochial, for being provincial, et cetera. And they reclaim this idea. And I can tell you just driving around North Carolina, the number of signs out in front of houses that said proud deplorable, I mean, they were just, they littered the highways in and around the major metropolitan areas in North Carolina. This gets folded up into social media marketing. This is one of their digital campaigns, which you can sort of see, it looks like we're gonna need a bigger basket. And it connects with how the people themselves, right, are sort of performing that deplorable identity at that moment in time. Um, and I would say that if you look, and this is like much closer to my own area of empirical research, that 
Very rarely do we look at campaign messaging in the context of information, although we often code for information. Um, that's so much more of online campaigning and advertising, for instance, are things like this. This is a Hillary Clinton Facebook ad, um, right? This is about asking you to sort of affirmatively declare your identity here as a woman and as an abortion rights supporter. Stand with us, right? Let's stand together. Again, it's this idea of creating these in-groups and connecting it with partisanship. Um, and you see this all the time. I mean, I spent a lot of time with Hillary Clinton's graphic comment. I'm increasingly interested in interpretive approaches, but you can sort of look at very clearly sort of making this argument um, that sort of Trump is not us, right? That is the opposing side. And that's sort of the fulcrum that politics hinges around. Um, and then online advertising broadly, this is where you see, right, come take Ted Cruz's guns. Um, you know, broadly sort of constructing this and fitting policy issues into this framework of what we believe and what the other side believes, but performing it in a deeply cultural way, right? Linking Obama with fascism, um, but Ted Cruz, right, there's no surprise where he's staging that photograph um, uh, in terms of sort of his performing his own identity as a Republican, as a Texan. And this is just a great example. One of the Republican, uh, this is one of the um, Russian organically produced posts, right? There's very little informational content here. Like, you're all in if you view this as a narrative of politics. But that's precisely the story of what the Russians were doing in this election, right? Activating this idea that Hillary Clinton is not one of us, Christians vote Republican, and then more importantly, they vote against Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. So let me just conclude by saying a few words about media, because I'm at 12 minutes. Um, First, I just want to say um, one of the interesting things, this is, this is a forthcoming book that's brilliant from Reese Pack, who's at CUNY, um, uh, that looks at Fox News in particular. And one of the arguments that he makes is that what's important about Fox is that they sort of took the conservative argument about overeducated elites using government power, right, to expropriate the wealth of producing Americans. Kathy has written a lot about this. Um, uh, they tied that to sort of a tabloid culture and presentation style, and then basically said that to be a white working class majority, these are the views that you need to have, right? Um, cultural populism, as he calls it, was a natural part of being white and working class, and therein lies its appeal. And you see this very clearly. This is Tucker Carlson. I'm bringing uh, him to UNC in a couple weeks or we're going to be moderating a conversation with him. What's so interesting is that he goes back and forth in his political talk shows between talking about things like more broadly in political terms and then shifting over into the address of things like you. So this is a context he did about how the media are against white people. Um, and, and just a quick sentence from him. Um, you are worried, and you should be, and now some smug private school kid from Brooklyn is lecturing <laughs> you about how you are the problem because of the color of your skin and the privilege it conveys. How much of that are you going to take before you explode at the unfairness of all? And at that point, why wouldn't you embrace a racial identity? Those were Tucker's words, right? So again, this broad story of politics being constructed on those lines. And I'll sort of just end, um, uh, Arlie's book was mentioned earlier, but the metaphor that she draws in Strangers in Their Own Land is that Fox is family. I love this metaphor because what does a family offer? A family offers a sense of identity and place and belonging, right? Emotional, social, and cultural support and security, and gives rise to political and social affiliations and beliefs. And this is exactly what Jeffrey Berry and Sara uh, Sobriai found in the outrage industry when they argue that one of the things that Fox News does is validate their pre-existing identities, give voice to them, but also provides them misconnects with Talia's argument. It gives them rhetorical ammunition to then go into their workplaces and other spaces in their lives with a set of arguments that they can make. I'll stop there. The first speaker had a slide, a break, breakdown of on issues that were concentrated on, and it was mostly uh, foreign policy, about half foreign policy. And then the next three seemed to be immigration and racial issues and guns. Those three, immigration, white supremacy, and guns, are what the Russians were concentrating on uh, going back several years before the election. And according to the Steele Memorandum, they worked on Trump 
five years prior to the election, so about back to 2011, and at least back to 2014 or so, they were working on uh, uh, creating chaos in America. That's their goal. And uh, also, uh, civil war is one of their dreams that it's possible to provoke the United States into civil war. I don't know uh, if that's a little far-fetched, but um, what do you think of the, the Russian efforts, uh, how they uh, came in and shaped the ground that uh, Trump so uh, assiduously plowed? One clarification when you said race, that, that is what it was labeled, and then you said white supremacy, yeah. which was not a label. It was a much more general <coughs> category of, uh, for example, there it was may a, not be identical to white supremacy, but. You know, no, so I'll, just to give you an example of what, what's in there. Close match. Um, I don't think so. I think it's a more general, so the way we define the category. So if okay. there is a unarmed black man who is shot, there is a typically a, a lot of press coverage, but if you look at the um, conversations on Twitter or people tweeting about a uh, particular event or that topic, uh, you'll find a lot of sustained activity uh, on Twitter. So we're tracking conversations like that. I don't think I would at least categorize that as white supremacy. So, so just to clarify the terms. Um, in terms of, uh, obviously there's been a lot of um, attention to Russian meddling and uh, accounts. We um, had no um, ability nor any effort in, in this analysis, which you know the data I presented was from two years ago uh, on those effects. Um, in general, um, along with is that a bot or not, um, is that a um, external influence or not, on a platform like Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat, um, it is such a difficult challenge to do this kind of analysis because it's, a, it's not a binary distinction. These are slippery slopes, but uh, it was not a focus, so I wish I could tell you more, but we didn't look at it. Yes. Now, I have a question probably mainly directed at Chris and Daniel. We're talking a lot about identity between rural and urban areas or between us and them. And I have a question, I mean, these are basically only like like poles or, or like empty shells, but but could you elaborate a bit upon what what identity means? I mean, what is what is rural identity or urban identity today in Wisconsin? I mean, what are the values around around which this identity is constructed? And can you say a bit more? Um, is there something else going beyond? Um, it's us versus them, you know. Like, like, are there certain values that that are important? Like, like, what is being deplorable? Is that is that like is that a matter of status or or of income or or education? Um, yes, that's my question. I'm gonna let Kathy answer the question for me. But I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. Well, the rural identity that we decided to start Which is why it's so powerful to have anything to do with 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think that's the key frame to sort of look at it is that it's partially how people narrate their own lives and their own social groups amid the nexus of all these other things and draw distinctions between a we and a them. Um, and that could be done on many different bases, right? I mean, it, it could be done on a, a basis of, of religion. Um, it could be done on the basis of partisanship or team identification, et cetera. It's not static. Um, I think that, you know, we, and I think a lot of the, the I mean, some of Julia's work and, and other folks, right, if you think about their sort of movement conservatives that was sort of grouped around an ideology of small government, but Trump did a really great job on showing how unmoored, right, a partisan identity is from any set of political ideology or strong policy positions. Look at policy positions flip on things like Russia, right? Um, uh, so I, I think it's it's more about like how people understand their broader sort of sense of sense of self and us and the groups they're a part of than any sort of more underlying ideological or policy positions um, uh, underneath that. Values are more interesting, I think, because values I think cut across the grain on, on various ways. Things like religion, for instance, which which you sort of mentioned, right? Um, the abortion debate. Um, uh, we are, right, uh, I think, Christian conservatives who sort of view politics through the lens of a set of moral values. Um, Steve Vasey at, at Duke has written a lot about this. That is a determining factor in some way of who they are and it gives rise to relatively consistent, clear sort of group identities over time. Thank you. Um, Silvio and then Sherry. Yeah, I mean, I, have, I, I find a very consistent story in the four presentations here. And one conclusion is that we should leave optimism for a better moment. <laughs> one conclusion. But the second one is how to reconcile the findings about partisan reasoning and ideological identity reasoning with the, in some ways, what we were discussing this morning about the premises and the opinion much of the normative arguments around the public fear or whatever you want to call it. Being what to do next, besides continue to demonstrate, I think, very persuasively pretty much in all the presentations, how identity, how this nexus of identity, partisan, and communication actually works. I mean, is that what we continue to demonstrate something that actually challenges much of the normative premises of the arguments that we have been developing? And this reminds me something that um, Lance was talking about earlier, right? Because in some ways, his argument is more of a normative argument about what needs to be done, which is, doesn't fit quite well the traditional models of sort of, I don't know, bracketing identities in Howard Mass language or stepping outside of this Howard scheme in broader uh, word. And it's not really the tradition of the public sphere, it's much more of a contention model of what democracy and therefore com communication is. That's where sort of please listen to, to you where I am right now. Thank you. I would say one place where I think we've, we do have some things to learn, and one of the focuses of the Wisconsin Project is, and this built on Daniel's notion just now that identity is in flux, How much, to what extent are the identities that are most in play are most salient and do the most work in politics, how much are those important because of the way that they're called out by either parties or politicians or other forms of communication? And I think that is a theme that connects all of these. Talia speaks to that, Deb's network speaks to, the, to that. Um, and uh, Kathy has, has spoken to that some, but I, I think we have more to do about that intersection. And maybe what I would add is in terms of thinking about future research inspired by what you're saying and what I think many of the uh, presentations here have talked about is we have this moment where it's contentious and there are all sorts of issues and cleavages taking place. Are there research endeavors? upon which we can embark on trying to bring them together. And I don't necessarily mean persuading people all to be moderates, but at least acknowledging what a different point of view might happen to be. And I think the academy is often focused on documenting the problem for far more than forward thinking about the solution. And I think that's uh, a little bit too bad. So I think that could be a challenge maybe to this room is thinking about addressing some of the harmful democratic aspects of what we're uncovering here. A couple of things come to mind. One um, is, you know, when you look at the effect of the media environment, you know, polarization is turning out to be a great business model uh, for the distribution platforms, for the content producers. Um, and so 
the um, <coughs> one of <coughs> excuse me one of the things that we're trying to do beyond measuring seeing these pictures what we call elements of the public sphere is to say well if you can image if you have sort of the the X-ray or sort of the the fMRI that you can start to have patterns of what uh, poor health looks like um, how can you use that as a guide for interventions. <clears throat> I think right now is an interesting moment with uh, certainly the technology companies. There's a big backlash. There's growing calls for regulation. Um, but it's not clear what the instruments for and, and who should be regulating. But if you think as an ecosystem, uh, if we had ways to characterize or sort of objectively um, uh, sort of create a needle and know what moves the needle and some notion of healthy versus unhealthy, uh, that comes, becomes a basis for, um, if not self-regulation, because I think there's this thing called shareholder value maximization, which is actually driving a big part of the dynamic. Um, but there might be some kind of self-regulation in the ecosystem and a role for new uh, kind of entities that take some of this sort of research and operationalize it and create feedback loops. So uh, just to make one concrete example out of the platforms, I mentioned celebrities or influencers. If you take the top few thousand or couple, maybe 10, 20,000 influencers um, in, in, in the US context, they may collectively have as much impact on the health of the kind of American public sphere as these big platforms that are right now the focus. Um, and if you go and spend time with a celebrity or a, a you know, a, kind of pop culture influencer, a sports star, you say, how do they know the impact they're having? How do they keep score? What, what are they personally optimizing for? Um, the answer is, grow your fan base. Um, and I don't know if you, you know, you're aware, if you have a few million followers, if you tweet once a product uh, name, you'll make tens of thousands of dollars one tweet. Um, and so the, actually the monetization and the building the fan base and the kind of consumption model for what the role of an audience member, there's sort of a machine in place and certain things that are being optimized for. But I actually think if you create new ways to keep score or new ways to uh, actually understand impact, um, there can be cha behavior change. I don't think we're like locked into necessarily a, uh, a, a sort of death spiral. Um, you know, so I think there's some possible ways of change there. And, and the last thing I'll say is, um, in terms of, because I love your comments about how things have become fragmented, um, and that you have uh, sort of silos of, um, of, it's not even alternate truth. It might just be a, a difference in what's worth attending to. Right? I think attention is actually at least as important as true versus false. And, that in, in two different tribes, values diverge and what's worth attending to diverges. And, um, so the, the idea of um, tapping into the internet to create new sorts of networks that reconnect and create at least weak links between trusted influencers and groups that have become separate, uh, there's no reason to think that sort of internet-based media that were done designing them, right? So in terms of kind of what, what you do about this, I think there's a lot of possibilities in creating new sorts of networks. Um, to, to build off the normative <coughs> question real quick, um, I'll just plug Nancy Rosenblum's book again on the side of angels, um, where she develops this ethics of partisanship. Um, and I think that could be broadened out to think about an ethics of contention, right? Um, and she, she lays out a set of arguments where what do partisans need to do? They need to be fundamentally pluralist um, which I think is a very key argument for accepting democracy uh, and accepting institutions. They need to work to expand participation, not limit it. Um, and they have a, a certain commitment or set of commitments to having to get the work of the government done, right? To get the work of, of governing done. Um, and I think what, what stands in sort of that broader vision of things is to say that like we can have polarization and contention as long as at the end of the and the end of the day we can all be committed to pluralism uh, in a liberal democratic society, um, and we can at the very least maybe fight for what we believe in, what our values are, without necessarily saying that it's my way or the highway, right? Um, so like the whole narrative around polarization, I struggle with sometimes because like the civil rights movement would have been seen as being polarized and radical and extreme in the South, right? Through through the 60s, it was right. 
Or talk about polarization today. Yeah, I'm polarized because I believe in transgender equality and I believe in climate change and I believe in gay marriage. I'm not gonna apologize for that. I am gonna fight institutionally to change those things because I believe in them. Um, so I think like, we have to think about like how are we talking about these issues and questions of value and politics that underlie it. At the end of the day, I'm a Democrat because I believe in pluralism. I believe that, others, uh, that other people have differences of opinion, different worldviews. And we're all together, and we have to figure out a way institutionally at least to hash it out. But I'm not going to make an apology for being polarized on issues I care about. Sherry. Sure. So, as a European institute recently um, started doing more work on American politics, there's a kind of puzzle that was inherent in a lot of the papers here. So, a lot of the research and a lot of the discussion about American politics is about the pernicious effects of partisanship. You know, it's an identity, it filters information, it makes conversation difficult, deliberation difficult, yada, yada, yada. The story in Europe is exactly the opposite, right? The story in Europe is about the decline of partisanship over the late 20th and early 21st century. People used to vote social democratic, or they voted Christian democratic, or they voted communist. They identified with those political parties and they voted accordingly. And so all of the problems in European democracy over the last decades are because these identities have declined, and now people are all over the place. They'll vote for anyone who promises them anything. So there is something there um, you know, that I wonder if you might comment on, right? Because the stories on the, other, the different sides of the Atlantic are exactly the opposite, right? The problem in Europe is a decline of partisanship. The problem here is the hardening of it. Um, I spent the first part of my career studying social democratic parties. Social democratic parties in Europe, especially during the early part of the 20th century, they built identities so familial, so strong, that you know you lived in them your entire life. And that was considered to be something very positive for democracy. Which brings me to the second half of my question, and Julia, who's going to be in the next part of the panel with me. Is the problem, therefore, perhaps not partisanship, but that we have partisanship now with relatively weak parties. And the reason why that might be problematic from a political science perspective is that you no longer have these institutions to kind of guide those citizens through the political process. And so, you know, a lot of the focus on the political, the politically pernicious, again, um, you know, um, consequences of, demo of partisanship in the American context, again, strike me as convincing until I think about the European context, in which they kind of fall apart a little bit. So I wondered if you might comment a little bit on that about A, the sort of cross-Atlantic kind of distinction, and B, whether if it's not just the partisanship that's problematic, but the partisanship in a context where democratic institutions have declined so much that there's nothing guiding these intense filtering mechanisms in the way they might have in the past. Yeah, I think that's a great point. If I could respond, and maybe you could you could react because uh, you know more about this than me. What if it's it's not so much the case that the parties are weak, although I think they are, but that we have on one hand asymmetry on the left and right. And so, just going off of what what Lance said, um, the problem on the left is not that we have. Uh, well, one of the major problems on the left is that people don't identify with a party, and the party that used to provide the primary structure for organizing action, especially voting just isn't there anymore for the left, or the, many people on the left don't find it to be meaningful. Meanwhile, on the right, it may not be that the parties are particularly strong and people may be dif disaffiliating from them, but partisanship is still strong, at least in the sense that it now provides a focal anchoring port for other kinds of identities. The Abramowitz point that, uh, that Chris brought up really demonstrates that um, partisanship is, is alive and well, especially as an expression of certain kinds of ethnic or religious or other kinds of identities. So could it be that we have a different kind of partisanship now that isn't necessarily tied to a specific party, but is more of a, a supranational super identity, as someone put it earlier? Well, I mean, I'll let you guys answer, but that's just restating the question, right? Which is that you have intense partisanship, but it used to be affiliated with some kind of institution playing within the democratic rules of the game. Now it's unmoored and therefore potentially more politically pernicious. So it's not partisanship per se, that is to say that people have these identities through which they filter information, yada, yada, yada. But rather that, again, the partisanship is kind of shifted from being, okay, I'm part of this family, you know, the social democratic family or the Christian democratic family that, you know, plays within the rules of the game and I'm always gonna vote for them, right? But now it's just like, I feel this way and, 
you know, there's nothing out there kind of, you know, guiding me or keeping me within the democratic, again, institutions or rules of the game. I don't know, but it's just, it's a puzzle for me studying both sides of the Atlantic. Just to respond very quickly, it, it might that not be the, the essence of the problem, that previously it was an identity tied to a party that specifically was part of a liberal democratic system and accepted the constraints and pluralism within it, whereas now the identity has more of a, a nationalist tinge or an, an ethnicist or populist tinge that uh, that doesn't feel those constraints. Devon? Well, just to build on that, I think one of the things we're seeing, certainly in the U.S. system, is um, the, the filtering up of both citizen voices and extreme voices in the media is being kind of guiding uh, pillars for parties, right? But the parties aren't guiding their own fates anymore or dictating their agendas. Instead, they're coming from who they think they need to cater to. So they tend to, like, when talk radio goes against certain policies, conservatives fall apart, right? And so that's an astounding change that the power shift away from the core of the party towards these opinion makers and opinion leaders, some of whom can be regular citizens occupying the online space. And I think that's something we have to understand and contend with, both on the right and the left. But I think the point you're making about, you know, is it the partisan identity or is it what the partisan identity now means and who's guiding the partisan identity? It's so critical. Yeah, and the only really great thing that I would add to that is having been part of a number of conversations thinking about like, what do we do to address the contemporary climate in which we're in right now, a proposal that keeps getting floated is we should really pummel all this money into the parties to make them strong again. So that just absolutely goes with what you're saying. Just in the interest of keeping us on time, I'm sorry there were several more hands up that I wasn't able to call on, but let me see just so we, we take those questions or comments um, offline as it were um, to, to get some refreshments before we kick off our third panel at three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.